ask you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to this passage in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 14. And I would ask out of uh, honor for our God and His Word, if you would please stand as I read. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir... You have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, last Sunday we began to dive into John chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. And we saw this overall arching truth. That Jesus saves sinners who trust in him. And it doesn't matter what type of sinner you are, only Jesus can save you. And what we're really seeing in these two chapters of John 3 and John 4 is a contrast between two types of people. Nicodemus was a very religious, self-righteous man. I mean, he he was the, the, the typical guy that would say he would go to church and be involved, you know, he would have been a deacon in the church and I mean, he was an upstanding citizen and all those things, but he still had a problem. He needed Jesus Christ. Well, now we have this woman here who we'll learn later has had multiple immoral immoral relationships and uh, she's kind of an outcast. And so it doesn't matter what type of sinner you are today, only Jesus can save you. And Jesus really is trying to get to the heart of our longings in this life. The fact is, we are all thirsty, and we all try to quench our thirst with the the putrid water of this world. But ultimately, our eternal satisfaction that we all of us crave is only found in relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Only Jesus, who is the living water, can actually satisfy. And last Sunday, we discovered just one simple truth from this, and that's that Jesus seeks people in need of living water. And really, this point can be summarized by the three applications we discussed. First application is this. Where is God showing you that you need to go with the gospel? And we saw that from verse 4, that Jesus had a destiny to go through Samaria. This was an appointed mission for him. And he deliberately went through this region where normally they would go around it. 
And so that begs the question for us to ask, both as Christians, but also as a church, where is God calling us to go and to show us where we need to go with the gospel message? Who has God placed in our life, in our sphere of influence, that he would be saying to us, you know what, I've put you there with that person so that you could share Christ with them, so you could reach out to them. And the same thing can be shared as a church. Where is God calling us as a corporate body to say, you know what, this area of our county or this, this community, they need someone to come in and really start to build relationships and love them. The second application we saw is that the ones who can, we consider most unworthy, Jesus seeks to make worthy. The people that you and I tend to think, well, I don't think they'll be interested, or, you know, I don't know if we really want those type of people here. Jesus is seeking to make those people worthy. And as believers, we no longer view people from a worldly standpoint but from God's standpoint. And here's the practical reality. If we're actually going to start reaching out to people and places and having people come in, here's the reality. You ready? Things are going to get messy. I think one reason we don't do that is because if you start getting into people's lives and loving them and working with them, it can be a real mess. Because sin is a real mess. And sometimes these people have made lots of sinful choices that have had far-reaching consequences and it's really hurt them. And, and if you were, they're, in a, they're in a pickle. And now they're saying help. And that means you've got to get dirty. But those are the people that God has called us to love and to serve and to minister to because those are the people that Jesus called, served and ministered to. And that really leads to the final question we consider, and that's this. If we're going to be like Jesus, we need to seek out those unlikely candidates and we need to turn the conversation to spiritual matters so that they can know him. That's the goal, to share Christ. As Luke 19.10 says of the Lord Jesus, that he came to seek and to save that which was lost, not that which was found. Well, we want to go on this morning and look at point number two, and that's that living water is a free gift. Living water is a free gift. It really focuses on primarily on, on verse 10. And there's three things I want us to see about how living water is a free gift. First of all, living water is a gift, and it's not something that you and I earn or something that we achieve. Living water is not something you can earn. It's not something you can achieve. You can't pay for it. There's nothing that you can do to, to get it. In fact, look at verse 10 and verse 14 in particular. Look at the words gift and giving. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, notice the source of this gift, it's from God, and who it is who's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now look at verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus stresses this point is a gift of God that I am going to give to you. The Bible is abundantly clear that salvation from start to finish is a gift from God. A couple of great references, Romans chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. And of course, you know this one, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It emphasizes that salvation is a gift. I love how Steve Lawson phrases it. He says, salvation is not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. And the problem is so many people in this world, that's what they think when it comes to salvation or having a right relationship with God is, well, I have to earn this or God's going to let me into heaven because, well, I've tried to live a good life. And so he's going to reward me with this. And that's exactly what Jesus uh, says to this woman here. As we will see, 
She knows her guilt. She is guilty. Think about it this way. The gospel is not actually good news if it actually does require us to do something. If it requires us to have penance or to reform your life in some way, to keep a bunch of rules and regulations or to do some unspecified number of good deeds and hope that someday God might let you into heaven on that basis. I put it that way in particular, because this is important for us when we talk about the gospel. This is crucial. It's an unspecified number of good deeds. How many good deeds do you have to do? And the majority of people that I have talked to about with the gospel, when it comes down to that, they've said, well, I hope my good deeds, they outweigh what? My bad deeds. Well, I've never found a place in this book that says you have to do, you know, 500 good deeds to outweigh one bad deed or whatever. How many do you know and have to do? That's not good news, is it? But it is wonderfully good news. If God this morning says to you, I'm offering to you the free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. And the great thing is he does. Now, I'm stressing this for a purpose. This is, this is Christianity 101, yet sadly today it is being missed. Even in churches. Nine times out of ten, this will be the issue with the gospel. Grace versus works. How is one saved? In fact, just within the last two weeks, there was a, a new survey came out, and I read on this, uh, that a majority, get this, a majority of American Christians, it says they do not actually believe the gospel. They accept some type of works-oriented salvation. Now they polled like those Christians who actually go to church, who are involved in their local churches. And of course it was lots of different denominations and there was some breaking down of evangelicals or main lines and all that. But the overwhelming thing was this. 52% of American Christians believe in some kind of works salvation. Well, yeah... Jesus did some stuff and did, you know, paid the price partly, but I have to do my part, is what that is. Now that's a sound. That's what's out there. And I thought about that. I thought, you know, well, 52%, you know, maybe they would be like, well, that's high, but, you know, if it was 92%, that would be something. I said, well, how do we put this into perspective? 52% of American Christians. We have, for all intents and purposes, we have about 45 people who come to Heartland Center Community Church. That means 23 people every Sunday believe they can work their way to heaven. Of those 45 that sit in the pew here. Is that acceptable? No way. For me, that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable if one believes they can work their way to heaven. And so that's why this is so important. It's because this is the message that is being lost today in our churches. The second thing is this, is no one is excluded from the offer. No one is excluded from the offer. I don't think many people like this woman think that because of their sins, they are not worthy of the gift. And unfortunately, I think we believers, we sometimes communicate this idea to them, even if it's unintentional. We think, for some people in this world, it's a pretty tall order for God to save them. Or worse, we even doubt that God should save them. I mean, there are some people in this world that do some pretty awful things, are there not? And we look at that and we think, man, they're really bad sinners. 
I don't know if God could save them, and I don't know if I want God to save them. In one sense, I'll be honest, we're kind of like the prophet Jonah. He did not want Nineveh to be saved, and Nineveh was bad. Make no bones about it. It was a wicked, evil place, full of immorality, full of sacrificing their own children on altars. I mean, you can get, can't get any worse. And so Jonah's perspective was, man, I do not want to go there. I do not want to preach this message because I do not want those people saved. I want God to burn them up. And I love the line that Jonah says in, in his book to the Lord. When those people finally do repent and turn to God. Jonah says, I knew it. I knew that you were God who was gracious and compassion, compassionate. That's why I did not even want to go to that city because I knew what kind of God you were. Let's be honest, sometimes we're like that. I, I know that you're going to save this person. Because I know what kind of God you are. I know that you delight to save. And I'm just not sure I want that person with me. Now maybe we don't have that extreme belief. But... I think sometimes we do put limits on God's ability to save people. Or we think maybe, well, I don't know if they're worth being saved. See, in the eyes of most of the Jews, I would say including the disciples at this point in their life, this woman, this Samaritan woman, she was not worth Jesus' time. We don't go to that kind of person. I mean, according to society, I mean, just being a Samaritan in their minds, that excluded her. Being a woman, I mean, that's strike two. Being an immoral Samaritan woman, that struck her out. That's three strikes against you, you're done. But Jesus took the time and the initiative to talk with her about living water. He didn't exclude her from offering her his gift because he doesn't exclude anyone and nor should we. The third thing we see is this. Jesus' gift completely satisfies the thirsty soul. As he says in verse 14 again. He says, I have this living water and you will never thirst again. Now we have to kind of talk about this phrase, living water. What's Jesus referring to there when he says that he has living water? Well, he's referring to, as he says here, the gift of eternal life that the Holy Spirit gives to those who put their faith in him. In fact, Jesus later explains this more in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, that's the condition, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. So we can put it this way. Living water, and what we saw in John chapter 3 about the new birth, they are the same thing, just different analogies. We all need to be born again. How do we do that? By faith in Jesus Christ. And when we do that, the Spirit regenerates us and gives us new life in Christ. We become a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. We were all dead in our trespasses and sins, and now we have been made alive together with the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he says, I give you living water. And every who who drinks of this water, you'll have this well of water springing up inside of you. See, beloved, true Christianity isn't a matter of rituals and ceremonies, but it is an inward, personal relationship with the living God. And that picture of living water springing up inside the person, it points to a, you will have a continual source of life that the indwelling Holy Spirit supplies to you. It's active and it's always flowing. It will never dry up.
So when Jesus says that whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst, he means that we who drink this living water, we can be satisfied in Christ. He rescues us from sin and from judgment. He gives us eternal life. Nothing can separate us from his love, as Romans 8, 31 through 39 says. We're his children under his loving care in every single situation, as 1 John 3, 1 says. He gives us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, as Ephesians 1, 3 says. His word is like water to our souls. However, Jesus doesn't mean that we stop longing for more and more of him. If you would, for the Christian, our longings have changed. We still have a thirst, but now it's a thirst for the right things. It's a thirst for God instead of a thirst for the world. You're thirsty for him. And he says, I will amply supply. Because we're told as believers, we are still to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Matthew chapter 5 or 6. Our hearts still pant after God like the thirsty deer pants for the water brook. Psalm 42, 1. We still can pray and should pray as the psalmist did in Psalm 63, one, O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. See, what we're longing for, what each one of us needs, is that vital relationship with God in this parched and weary land that we live in. But the good news, he says, is you now have a continual supply for your thirsty soul, which will never dry up. See, that's really what he's doing. He's contrasting here. He's saying, you can drink from the world's well. You can do that. But you'll have to keep coming back. And it may give you a little bit of satisfaction. It may give you a little bit of pleasure. It may give you a little bit of happiness for a while. But it will run out. But the living water that Jesus gives, it never runs out. That's really the contrast in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Where through the prophet Jeremiah, God says, you know... I have given to you myself the living water, but you have forsaken me. And then you've gone to these broken cisterns that can hold no water. Why do you keep going back to this nasty pool and trying to get satisfied when you have me at your disposal? The question is, how do we get this living water? And that brings us to the third point. Well, to receive this gift, you must know what Jesus offers. You must know who Jesus is. And you must ask him for it. Verse 10 is so important in this conversation. First of all, to receive this gift of God, you need to know what it is. And as we've already said, living water is salvation in Jesus Christ. Salvation from the penalty of your sin. Salvation from the power of, your, of sin in your daily life that the Holy Spirit gives to you when you put your faith in Christ. He comes and He indwells all believers. And again, salvation isn't a matter of keeping rules, of rituals, but rather of having new life by the Spirit in Christ that brings us into a relationship with the living God. And it's important that we know, and it's important that we emphasize that this is a gift. It is given to us. The second thing we need to see is to receive this gift of God, you must know who Jesus is. The woman needed to know something about this one who claimed that he would give her living water. And I love how Jesus says, if you knew who you're actually speaking to, 
you would ask me if you actually knew that I am the Son of God. And she's going to come to find out who he is because he's going to tell her. Then you would say, give me this water. And you would ask. See, beloved, here's the thing. Faith is not a blind leap in the dark. Faith is only as good as your object, what you're trusting in. To have faith in Christ, you need to know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And this doesn't require that you have some kind of Bible college or seminary education. But it does require the, some basic information. It does require you understand who he is in his person and what he has done. And really, that's the whole reason that John is writing his gospel, as we saw in John 20. He's written these things so that we may know that Jesus is the son of the living God and that you may know him and have life in his name. The fact that Jesus is able to give living water to thirsty sinners, it shows us this one truth, that he himself is God. The woman asked how Jesus could get this living water out of this well, right? He said, you offer this water, and how are you going to do that? Here's this well, you, have, you don't have a, a bucket, you don't have a pitcher. How are you going to get this living water? Because this well is really deep, and you have nothing at all to draw with. And of course, the answer to her that he gives, it gives a further challenge in verse 12. Are you greater than Jacob, our father? And I can just imagine Jesus with a little smile just saying, yeah, I am greater than Jacob. Before Abraham and before Isaac and before Jacob, I am. Jesus can say, yes, I'm greater because I am God. And he says the same thing to us today. If you're looking for life, you're only going to find true life in me. And yet the world still rejects Christ. And the third thing is this. To receive the gift of living water, you need to just ask for it. Jesus said, if you would ask, I would have given it to you. Recognize that you're thirsty and that you can never satisfy that thirst on your own. Jesus will satisfy you with living water and the one condition is you ask. If you ask, he says, I will give. But you must ask him for it. And really in this context, asking indicates faith. You must trust him for it. Let me close with just a couple of questions for us to consider. First one is this. Have you asked Jesus for the living water of eternal life? One thing that statistic I shared with you did for me as a pastor is remind me of my commitment to never assume the gospel. If I have the blessing of being your pastor for 20 years... 20 years from now, you will still hear me ask, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior? And I'll be honest with you, you should say amen to that. And it's not because I'm sitting here thinking, well, all you guys are not saved. It's because of that reality of what we saw before, that so often people are confused over the gospel. And I never want to assume, well, even though they've sat in, under my preaching for years and they've heard the gospel, that may be true. But what have you done with the gospel? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Because you can continually drink from the source of the world, but you will never be satisfied. And the final question is this, really for us as believers. Does your life prove that you're satisfied with Jesus? If people looked at your life and examined it and say, well, yeah, I mean, they just, they love Jesus above all else. They find their hope and their security and their peace and their joy and their fulfillment in their relationship with Jesus.
Is that what people would say of you? I'm afraid too often the world would say no. I think that's one reason that the world has just said, don't talk to me about Jesus because they haven't seen us find our all in all in him. One drink from Jesus. He says, you'll never thirst again. In the uh, email that you'll receive this afternoon, there's going to be a link there uh, to uh, an article. I was going to make copies, but then we're doing the whole copy thing, and so we're not doing that. Um, but I, I, want to, I want to offer to you an ask and give you a pastoral encouragement. There's going to be a link to an article. It's called 10 Flavors of Works-Based Salvation. And examine 10 things that so often are the issue for people and how they think they can relate to God based upon what they do. And I want you to read that article. I'm going to ask you, Pastor, to take the time. It'll probably take you 10, 15 minutes tops to read it. It's not super long. But examine it for yourself first in light of your own salvation. Have maybe you've been saved. Well, yes, I believe in Jesus but I also have to do one of those categories. But even if you say, no, you know what? I know that I am saved only by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. If you say, I rejoice in that fact today, here's what I want you to do with that article. So read it. Think about someone else. But think about it and how you try to relate to God on a daily basis. Because the one thing I'm convinced, and I know that I struggle with in my own Christian walk, is I am convinced, based upon the scriptures, I know without a shadow of a doubt, I cannot work my way to heaven. And so I am safe and secure. I got my, you know, I got my ticket to heaven. If I die today, I know I'm going there because of what Jesus Christ has done. But then on a day-to-day basis, I still try to relate to God based upon what I do and don't do. Christian life is based upon grace. And so as I read through those things, I thought, you know what? I still try to do some of those things. I still have some of those attitudes in, in, in the back of my mind of, well, I'll be more accepted by God. Or well, God you know, will love me more because I, I try to do these things. And so I want to encourage you to really to think through that. And to pray through that. Because I think it will be beneficial to your soul. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your abundant strength and grace in Jesus Christ. Lord, uh, I know so often I I try to fulfill the longings of my own heart with my own things. The things that I think will give me pleasure and joy, and yet I have you, the source of living water, ever before me. Lord, I pray that you would help me to see, and I pray that you would help your people here to see, no matter what they're dealing with. Everybody has their own uniqueness in this. What might be a temptation and a desire for me may not be a temptation and a desire for them. It may not be where their main problem lies. But I pray that, Lord, no matter what it is, you would show them yourself. We need your grace to grow in in the knowledge of who you are, Jesus. And so I pray, as you say, you want to abundantly give it. My prayer is, Lord, that we would humbly ask and humbly seek. And it is your name I ask, Jesus. Amen. Amen.